pure righteousness, I remember I saw this a little bit later, but like even some of those singles were released in like London on different labels and stuff. Mm -hmm. So what Damn. so what did you find out that Europe in particular loved your music so much? Well, how did that work? Actually, um when Pure Righteousness came out, I received a poster from Great Britain, from Europe, saying Pure Righteousness, number one selling import. Uh, yet I never performed over there. To this day, I would love to perform in London. I performed in Germany. I performed in Paris. But I never performed in like Amsterdam or like Switzerland, Great Britain, or, you know. So that's one of my goals to this day. Because I received a poster from over there saying I had the number one selling import. And I know I got a lot of fans in Great Britain. I've had members of the 5% Nation contact me from over there, letting me know that they became members of the 5% Nation because of my album. So I know I have a strong following in Great Britain out there. And I know that if they knew that La Kim Shabazz was coming here to perform, they would probably come out to Woodworks to see me. I think so. Because I never performed there before. Uh, and they love hip hop overseas. They it seems to me that they appreciate the culture a little more overseas than they do over here. And I'm talking about the culture of hip hop, which consists of not just rap, but break dancing, DJ, and graffiti. They love it. They really embrace it in other cultures. Not saying that we don't yet. Over there, you feel the difference. You feel the love and the passion and the difference. You definitely. Yeah. And I'm still active. I love all aspects of hip hop. Like some people are just rappers. Some dudes is just DJs. I'm a hip hop again. <laughs> I like graffiti. I like break dancing. I like the DJ aspect and I'm an MC. It's, it's like I've lived every aspect of this culture. I do graffiti now to this day. I still do graffiti. I used to break dance back in the day. I was DJing before I picked up the mic. So I embraced the whole culture. And that's something that people need to know. A lot of people think hip hop, they just associate it with rap. They forget about break dancing. They forget about graffiti. They didn't forget about the DJ. You have of these DJs out here now never seen a turntable before. They can't do what the DJs of old do, did back then. They never, didn't, never uh, spent wax before. Some of them never even seen a phonograph before, let alone a turntable. They grew, we growing up in the age now where everything is digital. They have Serato, you know, so they spend in music like that. A lot of these DJs never seen a real turntable before. A lot of the new generation that's out here. But all of that could be taught in hip hop educational classes. That's something that I've uh, started to do recently. Something that I, we're doing at the Street Academy, but that was something that I think needs to be done across the board. I think they do need to teach his hip hop history yeah. in the schools. It's such a prevalent culture. I mean, you see the way rock and roll stormed the world when it came out. Well, hip hop is the new rock and roll and it's embraced by children and people all over the planet. So why not teach the history of it? Because a lot of the youth now is such a disrespect for the origin and the founders of it. A lot of them don't even care. A lot of them don't pay homage. You have some that do. Yet a lot of them, when you uh, question them about the history of certain people throughout the history of hip hop, they have no idea. So it screams to me, well, this needs to be taught, lot. The history of hip hop needs to be taught. It needs to be taught. From, right. King, Tim, from King Tim on up. <laughs> well, speaking of history, uh, that was historic at the time was, of course, when you were on the cover of The Source with Paris and Big Daddy Kane. Uh-huh. So... I was looking at that recently, too. So what effect did that have you personally and professionally? Personally, it was like a dream come true to be featured on the cover of a magazine. And The Source magazine was like the biggest hip-hop magazine at that time. So... Personally, that was like a dream come true. And then professionally, what that did for me, it kind of like somewhat solidified me in hip hop to a lot of people that wasn't really checking for us before. 
they're like, yo, you make the cover of the source, you somebody. <laughs> That's how they looked at that. You on the cover of the source magazine, you somebody. Yeah, that was like a hip hop summit that they did. I think uh, Puba would have been on the cover. Some of them didn't make the photo shoot. I think it was just me, Kane, and Paris at the photo shoot. But when we actually had the actual interview, I think Harry Allen was interviewing us. I think Puba was in the room. A couple of more people were there. But I think it was just me, Kane, and Paris for the photo shoot. Yeah, professionally, that did a lot for me. That, like I said, that kind of that's kind of like a stamp of approval, being on the Source magazine. And then uh, personally, it was like a dream come true, man. Like, wow, I'm on the cover of the source with Kane, me and Big Daddy Kane. Kane looking all smooth. <laughs> yeah. That's when he was on his lover boy thing at that point, I think. Yeah, he was definitely in the Prince of Darkness getting that. Right, right, right. He was at his lover boy stage at that point. Yes. That's my brother to this day. Sharp, witty on the mic. Love my man. Gave me the opportunity to freestyle at his party. And the funny thing about that, if you ever get a chance to hear that, the rhyme I kicked was some X-rated shit. It was an X-rated rhyme in dedication to Apache. Because me and Apache was together all the time. Now, I'm the righteous one. Yet, in dealing with our culture, supreme mathematics is a science of everything in life. So I'm not religious. Just because I'm righteous don't mean that if you show me a hustlers magazine i'm gonna be like oh that shirt or something and turn away from it no nah, i'm gonna look through that <laughs> i'm gonna look through it you know what i mean so with that said we at kane's party patchy like yo rock i want you to rock but i don't want you to kick the positive shit they know you for i'm like what you talking he's like yo kick that x-rated shit you dedicated to me i'm like all right so i got on there and i kicked some x-rated shit and the funny thing the funny thing about that is that uh, one time I was out in Brooklyn and uh, Easy Mo B pulled up on me like, yo, what's up? What you doing out here? I'm like, well, you know, I'm out here visiting my brothers, whatever, whatever. He was like, yo, you know that freestyle you did at Kane Party? I was like, yeah. He was like, yo, Mr. C selling that on a cassette out here. I'm like, what? He was like, yo, they pumping that all in the streets of Brooklyn. They ain't never heard do rhyme on no X-rated shit. They like, you killed it. Yo, I'm like, huh? He was like, yo, they playing that tape all around Brooklyn right now. I'm like, what? Yeah, man, just history right there. Yeah, freestyling at Kane's party with me, Master Ace. Me, Master Ace, Positive K. I think Jay-Z might have been there that night because, you know, it was a Kane's birthday party. And this had to be around, had to be around 91, 92. Yeah, but it's all on YouTube, though. You can catch that whenever you get a chance. There it is. And then, um, even though it was still within the family, getting with the Naughty by Nature with the one, two, three, um, Mm -hmm. what, how did that shape and affect you? Because that's a platinum album. That's a huge thing. Right, right, definitely. So how how did that kind of affect your outlook and make you look look at the business maybe in a similar way it didn't change you or did that well yeah it definitely changed me like even before naughty you know success and they came along i was starting to realize like my contractorial situation so once naughty came out with the success of that what really got me was that i was on the track one two three that album sold over three million records and uh when my royalty came, Aaron snatched it. That's what made me wake up. Yes. Whoa. That's what really made My publishing shares from what I did on one, two, three, went to Aaron Fuse. That's when I realized, yo, bro, you got to get up out of this situation. So it was at that time that uh, Shakim and Latifah had developed Flavor Unit Management. Flavor Unit name was kind of hot in the industry at that time. I was on Naughty's album. Naughty had blew up. Uh, Tommy Boy had gave Patchy a deal. He started working on his. And they knew that I wanted out. So they started working on getting me up out of there. And being that the Flavor Unit was hot, the name was hot at that time, you had offers out there for me. You know, Aaron Fuchs would not release me. Aaron ain't going to let me go. He, I guess Aaron attitude was like, no, I don't eat off La Kim Shabazz. None <laughs> so I had to just, yo, they tried to buy me out of that contract. 
other companies was interested in me. I guess, like I said, Aaron is a good person, yet I guess business-wise, people didn't want to deal with him. They just didn't want to deal with him. So it was like nobody wanted to take upon a responsibility of that contract. So I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm not recording no more for Tough City. I looked at the body of work that I had did for them already. I said, this got to equate to at least about three albums worth of material. I'm not recording no more for this guy robbing me blind. So I eventually got, um, I was at a standstill at that point. I couldn't really record. Because I was like, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. If I do a feature with somebody because of the contractorial situation I'm in, he's going to eat. And I'm not going to keep allowing him to, to corner me like that. So that was at a point where I started taking production serious. I started getting money through doing beats. I produced the joint for Latifah and Shaba Ranks called What You Going to Do. I started doing a little production work here and there for Latifah that kept a little money in my pocket here and there. And it was also at this time I started managing my nephew. My little nephew's name was Shatim. I, um, he first appeared in a video in Chill Rob's G's video, Let Me Show You. He's the young child that's dancing in that video. And there was this videographer named Diane Martell, who became one of the biggest video makers in uh, film and hip hop videos. But anyway, Diane took a liking into my nephew because he was so small and he could dance. He could do all the dances that like EPMD dances and them was doing. My nephew was real small, he could do it. So uh, she took a liking into him. And from that point on, she would always call me for any videos she was doing. Next thing you know, my nephew was dancing in LL video, Maxi Pre's video, he's in Hershey commercial. I ended up signing him to SAG. He ended up in a movie with Michael J. Fox called Life with Mikey. Uh, Mariah Carey, when she first came out, he's featured in her video. Her first video, I think her first single was called, um, what was Mariah's single called? She's in the school in Bayonne, I remember it, because I didn't actually take my nephew to that video shoot. My brother's woman had took him there. Yeah, it was for Mariah Carey's first single, Someday, right? My nephew was dancing in that video, Mariah took a liking into him, and from that point on, his history, like, we were set. Managing my nephew, he's dancing for Mariah. Mariah actually paid for us to go to the MTV Video Music Awards. My nephew danced for Mariah Carey at, the, at her performance for the MTV Video Music Awards. He actually took pictures with Hammer, James Brown, all of them, so... That kind of kept my career afloat, managing my nephew and doing beats. And at the same time, working on getting away from Tough City. It took me about three, maybe four years to get up out of that contract. Yet I eventually did it. And, you know, I, like I said, I have no regrets. I'm grateful for what Aaron did. Do. Yet that's a hard pill to swallow when you see, you know, the success of your peers and you see your situation. And you're like, oh, no, this is not good. Got to get up out of here. You know, but I'm grateful to for the opportunity, you know. And uh, last thing before we wrap up, too, because um, I know it's been a minute now, but with the... Uh, yeah, I, I've been running my mouth. I apologize. <laughs> no, no. I, I've been enjoying every minute of it, but... No, I appreciate it. With the Class A Felony song that I can't take it no more, um, how did you get involved in that? And what, what I know it was a dedication album. Mm -hmm. but how did you get involved in that? And you and Diamond worked on that song together. But what was that? What did that mean to you? And what was it? Oh, man, that meant a lot to me. I got involved with that from just being cool with Diamond. Me and Diamond being cool, going to his sessions, being his man, going to see him, you know, just uh, staying in touch with D. He had that opportunity came up. He presented it to me like, Lock, yo, I want you to get on this track with me, yada, yada, yada. We brainstorm on the idea. And that's how that came together. He actually did the original and he remixed that joint. I love that joint to this day. Anytime I play that joint, people are like, who did that beat? That's Diamond. Me and Diamond never performed that either. I told him one day, man, you got to perform that song one day. That would be that crazy. Yeah, that would be crazy if me and him get to perform that one day. I think that could be done, definitely. I just seen him uh, not too long ago. And I'm in uh, the new Tyler Quali video for Gotham. 
Yep. I'm a short man with the black one in the back. <laughs> yeah. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, Bob, on your TV basketball? Your MTV has just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.